so that is our shader. Uh, I think all hell will break loose if we look at what's happening in the game right now. Let's find out. Yes. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. Happy vacation. Yeah, same to you. Uh, I, I guess this is kind of the start of your vacation now, right? I'm like, I'm still in it. Yeah, I I, yeah. I was off on started on Thursday, so mm -hmm. I've had some. Yeah, but this is like your first official day off. Uh, this is actually like my first day off. It's not yeah Christmas related. Right. <clears throat> and you're off the entire week. I'm off the entire week. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. Yeah. Really stoked. Yeah, I definitely needed the time off. I. Uh, I think I just played PS5 all weekend, which is great. Oh, and so how did that go? Oh, wonderful. Uh, I beat Ghost, which is really cool. Uh huh. I, I loved it. Uh, and I played a little Bug Snacks and a little Spider Man. I've heard really good things about Bug Snacks, actually. Bug Snacks? It's like kind of a demented Pokemon Snap. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it's like if, if Pokemon was like extremely dark and weird. And it's like they eat them. Like they're very explicit. Like they eat the Pokemon, and then their body parts turn into the Pokemon. So like you eat a strawberry bug, and your arm turns into a strawberry, and it's like a little horrifying, actually. Do they eat Pokemon in Pokemon? You know, they're really unclear on that, but they serve meat just all over the place. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they eat the Pokemon. I, they must, because like there are no other animals for them to eat. <laughs> That's are there regular animals in Pokemon, or is everything a Pokemon? Like, are there dogs? I don't know. Are there dogs in Pokemon? Uh, there might be. But also, like, the Pokemon are dogs. <laughs> Let's see. Um, animals in the po Pokemon world. This, is, this has been asked to the degree that uh, <laughs> there's a whole wiki page on it. Um, They've been mentioned a number of times. Uh, they're mentioned in relation to a Pokemon category. Mm. So, <gasps> so to them, animals are just like <laughs> this is hilarious. <laughs> oh man! Like there it is. It's a dog. It sure is a dog. <clears throat> so to them, animals are just edible Pokemon. Is what's happening? Ah, yes. They're this guy's like... on his way to be eaten. He's oh, here. Oh, that's rough. Well, you know, other cultures, different mm -hmm. standards. That looks so cute. But yeah, it's true. <laughs> it does look like a cute dog. <laughs> they're not gonna draw. Uh, they're not gonna draw uh, an uncute dog in Pokemon. Mm -hmm. Plus, all dogs are cute. So. Uh, but yeah, I recommend. I recommend Bug Snacks. It's silly, weird. Uh, it convinced me that the controller is like not just a gimmick. Oh. Yeah. Okay. I mean, like at the Astros thing was cool, but the. The bug snacks, the triggers are like a camera shutter, and it presses down like exactly half, and then you have to really squeeze it to to shoot the picture. Right. It's just like, it's really cool. <laughs> it, nice. like, it actually feels like a different device that you're holding. So, um, look at this. Yeah, we're driving around. Whew. We've got a lot going on. I'm, look, I'm noticing the FPS is like hovering around about half of what it should be right now. Mm hmm. Um, and that's not normally for this computer, so I'm guessing that is the zoom. screen share. It's yeah. Zoom. Yeah. Zoom! That's too bad. Yeah. Which is fine. Um, there's lots of room for optimization. <clears throat> um, but let's talk a little bit about what's, what's changed since mm -hmm. uh, we last saw this. Yeah, I see a, a big floating cube, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, so let's start with that. Um, Basically, uh, we now have sort of world space correct targeting. Um, the turret doesn't turn, but where the red line is is basically where I would shoot. Mm -hmm. So basically, the, any bullet that you see should trace along the red, the red line there. And the box is just a volume around that point. Um, now, before, the way that we did this is we just said, like, wherever the upper left corner of the screen is in the world. <clears throat> Let's just add that to the um, mouse coordinate. Mm -hmm. And because the pixels in the screen were one-to-one -to, -one to 
pixels in the simulation, so to speak. There, there wasn't anything more complicated than that to decide where the tank was aiming. Um, we've got a, a little bit more of a co more complicated story now because we have perspective, right? Right. right so the, the mass position was actually more distorted the further away from the center you are. Um, yeah, that's that's right. Yeah. So basically, um, you know, as, you, you'll notice it more towards we go, as we go to the back, like. Um, the squares are narrower in the back, right? Mm -hmm. The tiles are narrower than they are up in the front down here. Um, so if you move left to right here, you should actually be aiming at different squares. Like you should basically be transitioning between squares more quickly. The same mouse movement in the back moves more world space tiles than the same mouse movement up in the front. That makes sense, yeah. Um, and so that, that takes a little bit of math, mm -hmm. right? So, um, I am experimenting with uh, with light mode right now in my text editor, so bear with me here. Oh um, yeah, it takes some getting used to, but I do like light mode. Yeah, yeah, it's nostalgic for me. Um, I'm not sure if it's easier or harder to read on the stream though, <laughs> so we'll see. How's the font size, by the way? Looking good, looking good. Okay. Um, so we basically get a mouse position this is the code here that det determines where we're shooting, or at least where we're aiming. And then the camera um, has some knowledge about like how big the screen is. The camera also kind of knows like what angle it's pointing, because uh, the camera's flying around in the sky right now, right? And mm -hmm. it can use both of those pieces of information to basically say, okay, well, if you're pointed at uh, that spot uh, in the screen, what I'm actually going to do is figure out where in the world your mouse cursor is currently. And so imagine the camera is kind of like your phone, right? Floating around in the sky. Let's see if I can use myself as a backdrop here, right? Um, the camera is over here. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's a plane in front of the camera, which is sort of the virtual screen, right? And that is, that is our plane of projection. Yeah. So basically, imagine the, the mouse cursor basically is kind of tracing along that screen, right? Mm -hmm. So once we figure out where that position is, that's the uh, mouse world position. That's this value there. So mm -hmm. that's like, if there's a virtual screen floating above the camera that's like hovering in the sky, um, then the mouse is a point on that. And so what we do is we take the camera's position and draw a ray from the camera's position to the, the position of the mouse on that plane. And we project that ray through that up until it hits the XZ plane, because the XZ plane is the ground, right? We like we've sort of defined this as like basically consistently at an elevation of zero on the mm -hmm. y-axis. So that's what this math is. Um, this is basically just saying I'm going to take my camera position and I'm going to take the angle of that ray on both the XY plane and the ZY plane. I'm going to take it and just basically project it down, and that'll give me the X, X coordinate and Z coordinate of where I'm actually aiming. Hmm. So that's how we that's how we can derive where this point actually is. Gotcha. Um, that's sorry, funny. I don't have my uh, I don't have my uh, my iPad set up, so I, I would draw that for you. Oh, that's okay. No, that that made sense, and that's okay. Yeah, I I could definitely I can see how we were distorted before too. So that's great. Yeah. Neat. Um, is, is our things, yeah, sorry. Go I was going to say, is our projection like, or is our perspective a little strange? Cause I feel like the cube gets narrower and taller and that's not what I expected that distance. So I know what you mean and I'm not exactly sure what's up with that. Okay. I, I, I suspect it might be field of view. Um, mm -hmm. but the code that draws the cube, I guess we can just jump right into that. Um, everything is debug draw right now, and debug draw works again, right? So if I, I can turn debug draw off, and it feels weird now, right? Honestly, the grid lines should maybe not be debug draw. They just look so good. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, especially because like the terrain right now is very, very uninteresting. Actually, debug draw is actually what's slowing us down, right? Uh, oh, which is interesting. What happened? Turn it off again. I'm not sure if it's visible through Zoom, but you oh. can really see me scooting around. Uh, um, it looks about the same, but. I realize the FPS counter goes away too. Oh, yeah. Um, Interesting. Oh, there it is. Yeah, from all the way from 60 down to... That's fascinating. And it's probably because we're debug drawing um, hitboxes around everything, mm. right? Mm -hmm. 
Um, and there's a lot of debug draw going on here. Um, when we shoot, I was trying to debug some. Do they have little trails now, or is that? They do have little trails, oh, yeah. That's and and amazing. this this was actually just me trying to figure out a variety of different things. You know, we had some issues with like bullets disappearing, mm -hmm. and we also had issues where bullets were seen to be hitting the wrong thing. Right? We'd be like here, and we'd be shooting off to the left, yep. and the trees behind us would die. Yep, absolutely. Um, it turns out the issue with with that was that our hitboxes for the bullets were defined in absolute units rather than units relative to the tile size. Oh, shit. The one yeah. place. OK. Yeah. So basically, um, this was just like hard coded to the number two or something like that. Oh, crap. And at, at one point, we basically made everything 24 times smaller, right? Because yep. like originally, these these tiles were 24 by 24 pixels. And now they're one by one unit, virtual units. Oh, that makes so much sense, though. Thank goodness. Yeah. That's a big so we were basically just generating these gigantic bullets. The other issue that we were having is we were shooting and you would see a bullet like disappear. Like mm -hmm. it would like shoot this far and then like completely go away. Uh, and for whatever reason, uh, you know. Well, I, I don't, I think what we were seeing actually was the bullet that was a two by two tile hitting something two tiles away. Right. And, and looking like it disappeared, but in fact it was hitting correctly. So that that's great. We had another issue. Okay. Um, I've moved some stuff around. We'll, I'll, we'll get to that. So I'll probably spend the first hour today just like talking about the changes that have happened in the last week or so. Um, where uh, I, I moved the sync server state function into the client because I, I felt like that was kind of more what it was about. Mm. Um, oops. And I noticed a client folder and hopefully a server folder. I'm very excited about that. because There's yeah. no server folder yet, but uh, I think you're right that we should add one. Um, one thing I did notice is that we had a less than or equal sign here originally. That's right. Um, and this dot simula simulation frame is the frame that the client is currently on when it enters this update tick, mm -hmm. which weirdly means that we simulate the current frame. And then when we're done with this function, which mm -hmm. is called sync server state, mm -hmm. we then simulate the frame again, right? <laughs> now I thought I thought the end of sync server state incremented the frame, and that's where we started simulating the next frame. Did we stop doing that, or, or uh, we were just I think wrong? that changed. Yeah. The simulation frame is, is incremented here, okay, and only here. Great. So what the less than or equal to meant inside of sync server state? Was that we were like simulating the current frame, and then but without input because right? we didn't collect the input yet. This mm -hmm. is this 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 player input system is simulated just on the client side to collect mouse input. Um, so we we would simulate one frame without player input, and then we'd simulate it again with player input. So some there were some like really weird artifacts coming. Oh, that's really strange. Yeah, it's good that I guess since we backtracked and replayed correctly, like things never got terribly out of sync. But also that's bizarre. Yeah, the, the rollback, I think, is what saved us mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Damn. Um, so that was kind of one of the saving graces there. So does that mean, was everything moving slightly too fast? Or actually just rollback really just covered it? We were predicting one frame too far. I think our prediction was always slightly off as a result. All right. Like our prediction, like we predict ahead a couple frames inadvertently and then roll back. Because uh, the rollback would, like that less than or equal to was in uh, our reprediction loop. Uh, oh, this stuff. Okay. This is reprediction. So essentially, it would get it would get rolled back the next frame uh, based on the undo prediction call here. That's a great get. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and that like I I built a lot of Chrome trying to figure that one out. Oh, um, no. And that's actually the reason why this is in a client sim class right now. Um, Mm. Uh, I'll get to the debug draw stuff later. Let's just follow this tangent a little bit more and talk about the client directory now. Um, I now have... The client used to have a render function and an update function, mm -hmm. and I was like, this makes it hard to unit test the client simulation because um, I don't want to have to like have an actual browser 
have an actual GL context to actually run the uh, 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 to run to run the client simulation and like determine like is my state what I expect it to be given the set of server messages or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, ironically, I never actually ended up writing any unit tests, but I was like, I want to make it easy to test, <laughs> or at least more testable than it currently is. Um, ideally, I think what we we should be able to do now is if, if we did want a unit test, we could just basically instantiate in Node.js a instance of client sim and an instant, uh, instance of a server and just have them pass, pass messages back and forth. Um, if you look at the client sim constructor, um, this used to take uh, an HTML element. Like it, it took like an actual browser right. object, which yeah, was like yeah, the yeah. canvas or something like that, right? Uh, and it no longer does that. Um, now it takes a bunch of interfaces. Mm -hmm. It takes a keyboard, which is an interface, a mouse, which is an interface, a model loader, which is an interface, a debug draw, draw writer, which is an interface. And these can all be like, this is all just dependency injection here. You can mock those out and make them do nothing. Nice. And so ideally, we could like instantiate a client sim, instantiate a server, and have like a fake mouse or a fake keyboard, um, which we were actually able to do before. I, I think we the, the idea of the mouse and keyboard being interfaces, we, we had it originally. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I wonder, I don't recall why we went away from that, but that's great. Oh, oh, I think we always had it. I, I don't think we, we went away from it. It was just that we were also passing in uh, a, a canvas element because mm. the client owned the renderer. Um, and oh, now the renderer gotcha. has been moved out of that nice. um, into something called the render manager. I would call it the client client renderer, but we already have classes called the render. <laughs> Right, uh, like we have the render 3D, which is like what renders are like it talks to OpenGL directly. It basically, is the OpenGL abstraction layer, right? And mm -hmm. when we load models and stuff, it, it like keeps track of the VAOs and that sort of thing. The render manager, on the other hand, um, is the thing that knows about canvas elements. Uh, it actually yes. has an update function which performs the actual rendering. So mm -hmm. it'll like clear. It'll set the world view transform. Uh, it'll render a bunch of stuff, and uh, I'll talk about the new render interface as well. Um, so there is also a client object now, which is primarily just the composition of the client sim and the client render manager. And if you look at the update, it's not super dramatic. It updates the render manager, and it updates the simulation. Nice. Right. Um, the reason why I added this, this is actually a lot of what used to be in client main.ts. Client main is our entry point. Mm -hmm. And this used to be way longer. It used to have a bunch of stuff in here. And now it just instantiates a client. Add some kind of like window level listeners. Uh, the actual request animation frame happens here. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, uh, it's relatively simple. Um, the reason why I wanted to have this class here is that I added the ability to restart the game from the browser. Yes. So if I do shift control R, it restarts the game. Ugh. And basically I was getting annoyed. You know how sometimes I'd like close the browser window and the server would be like already in the game. Mm -hmm. And if you open the browser window again, I'll do it right now, right? If I, if I, if I close the browser window mm -hmm. and then um, let's just open it up again. I'll just do it from using debugging this time. Um, oh, whoops. I need to change the debug target. There we go. Ah, what, what is, what is it doing right now? It should just be launching Chrome. There we go. Oh, weird. Was it opening a debug? Was it opening a Chrome tab for the debugger too? Um, it should. It, well, it basically switched to Firefox really quickly. I don't know oh. what the service. This might be a, a remote. A remote debugging thing. Um, could not attach the main target. Let's try that one more time. This is like way slower than I'm used to it being. Um, and I wonder if this has to do with like the remote session. 
Yeah, it's kind of weird. Huh, power. Um, let me go ahead and just open up another Chrome window. It's got to be Chrome, mm -hmm. right? Because Firefox is currently too slow. <sighs> Heartbreaking. Well, it might be our code, right? True. So this is normally what happens when the game is already running and we like, mm -hmm. we just like can't can't enter it. But if I do the reload hockey, I can reload it again. Right? Oh, I'm so happy about that. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty. It was a pretty nice quality of life improvement. But because we did that, we had to destroy a bunch of objects client side. Right? We had to like I basically had like we had to have a new client sim, a new client render manager, a new mouse, a new keyboard. Right. And I wanted that bundled up somewhere. So I created the client class to kind of encapsulate all that stuff. Um, so that, essentially that what happens is in client main, when we do the hotkey, we call client.restartserver. Mm -hmm. And restart server just basically says, I want to just destroy all the old stuff and reassign it. I love it. Yep. Ah, oh, that's nice. Yeah. So that's the client now got a bunch of stuff in there um and then the client render manager is essentially our old render function pulled out of the old client sim and it's now kind of separated there's a little bit of redundancy there um so for example sync viewport dimensions this is what uh it gets called when we resize the window mm -hmm. um that has to get passed down into both the render manager, obviously, because the renderer needs to know what the viewport, how big the viewport is to adjust like the projection matrix and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but the simulation also needs to know about it. You think it wouldn't, but remember how we were doing this picking thing where like, uh, where is the mouse pointing at in world space? Mm -hmm. That that is handled by the simulation because it's simulation relevant and it needs to know the viewport dimensions in order to do this. So there are some like visual orient, like seemingly view, like view oriented things that the simulation still cares about. Um, but we can fake it, and we can depend dependency inject it. That makes sense. Would it yeah. would it make sense to inject that into the mouse instead? Uh, that is a good question. It could be, it could be part of the mouse. There might be other things like right right now. The way that the client sim handles it right now, um, is that it passes it down to the camera, and mm. it the fact that it lives in the camera is kind of arbitrary. It doesn't have to. I don't think the camera uses it for anything else besides like what does what what is viewport dimensions used for it's used to basically say i want to take the screen position and map it to a world position which is exactly this thing and you're you're right to say that it could be a mouse oriented mm -hmm. thing. um the thing is though in order to make this calculation you also need to know uh well i guess all you need to know is the, the fov really and that's also something that the camera knows about, but it's not like it's not like the camera uh, uses it for anything else. Because um, if the, uh, you can imagine, if the FOV gets narrower or wider, the way that we map right. uh, mouse positions to world positions changes. Right, the math changes a little bit. I it does seem like it belongs here. That that makes sense. Yeah. Um, the the thing is, the FOV itself, since we don't change it right now. I think we just hard code it in both the renderer and the camera. So the that the value here in the camera is not connected to the value in the render. It really should be. So we need some way of connecting those values in a way that still allows us to preserve uh, the separation between the renderer and the simulation. Because hmm. the only reason why the simulation ultimately cares about it is th is because of like where it's pointing. And so I could see an argument like you're saying of like just like maybe. If it's not like, if it's not the uh, the mouse that knows about it, somehow we can like inject a f like this function into the simulation, and make this function like totally opaque, and so that you don't necessarily know about the viewport dimensions of the FOV. Because it seems like the simulation maybe shouldn't care about that, but we need it still to do this like input handling. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So that's the client. Uh, Got a little bit more complicated in terms of the file system, but I actually think it's easier to read the code now because it's not just like this giant extended thing. Um, it does raise the question of how we handle debug draw, right? Because debug draw is a render oriented thing, but it's also mm -hmm. something that the simulation needs to handle and touch. Right. Um, so there is now a debug draw um, interface. Yeah, I saw that go by. 
Mm. Uh, where is it? Debug, drop. So um, there are two interfaces. There's a debug drawer writer. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is what basically gets threaded down into anything that, that wants to make debug draw calls. Uh, and it looks pretty much the same as before. Basically, uh, it is a function that you call and pass a callback because if basically if debug draw is disabled, we don't want to do any of the debug draw calculations and that kind of thing, right? This is it's a little bit like when you write a unit test for a function that is supposed to throw an exception, you pass like a function that throws it so that you so that like the unit test thing can the the expectation suite can figure out that oh I need to like wrap this in a try catch or something mm -hmm. like that. Right? Um, um, we just have two functions, draw 2D, draw 3D, and they look pretty much the same. Uh, you return different objects if you're trying to debug draw on 3D. Um, there is a debug draw reader, which is what the renderer cares about, um, and basically says, I need to basically pull off objects that got generated so I can actually render them. Um, there is a mock debug draw here, and what this is is that the object that we pass into the server, si server simulation. Yep. Imagine the server doesn't care, right? So the server just, like, passes this down there, but then it's just stubs, basically. Um, maybe stub debug draws is a better word mm -hmm. for that. And then I have a debug draw object that implements both of these interfaces, right? Um, and what it does is draw 2D just like appends the return value of this make renderables function each time it gets called. Draw 3D is the same thing. And then get 2D and get 3D just returns the contents. Um, Nice. And then there's also an update here. Uh, and the update just kind of clears stuff out for, for the next frame, but I also added lifetimes for the 3D draw. So that's why you can see tails here. That's, Basically, that's really cool. Um, there's like a lifetime of like three frames. Mm -hmm. And this is just drawing the position of the bullets. Hmm. And I added this because I was like trying to figure out why are my bullets shooting something behind me, right? Like where are the bullets? Are they spawning behind me? Mm -hmm. If I just debug draw the position of where the bullet spawns just for that frame, it'll come in and go out within in 16 milliseconds. I won't even be able to see it. So I just added a lifetime to it so you can actually see them nice. uh, stick around for a little bit longer. So the way that you do that is actually this debug draw object, um, all it is is like it's how what what you're actually going to draw and then like a lifetime, the number of frames, and that just defaults to one. Mm -hmm. And the way that that lifetime works is just that when the debug draw object gets updated, it just ticks the lifetime down for some of those objects, hmm. right? Um, OK, so uh, if we go to the client sim. Now, for the um, yeah. grid lines there, does that mean they're getting wiped out and recreated once per frame? Um, yeah, they are a okay. model. So the, the VAO is not getting recreated. Um, okay. Yeah. But there are certain things that are getting wiped out and recreated every frame. So this, um, so this, uh, this red line, mm -hmm. that's not a model that is easy to make into a VAO because its position is constantly changing. So this is actually literally just a line that's there's a new VAO getting created and destroyed every every frame. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Um. But. The cube here is a, is a model because I added a model for it. And is it like the same model as the walls with a different uh, shader? I guess I peeked ahead and saw that there's two shaders now too. Oh, yes, there's two shaders. So real quick, um, the way that the debug draw object gets put into the simulation is through the constructor. Mm -hmm. um, we just pass it in there. And it's just the writing side of it, right? Like the, the simulation doesn't care about the reading side. It doesn't care about pulling the objects that got enqueued. It just cares about like putting them into the queue, right? Um, so if I go back up one level to the client, what the client actually does in its constructor is it creates a debug draw, puts it into the render manager. The render manager cares about both the writing and read side. Mm -hmm. But then it also puts it into the client sim. So it's like the same object being injected into both. Mm -hmm. uh, but the client render manager actually has access to the full thing. Nice. It has access to both the writing and reading side. Um, and it has access to the writing side because you might want to debug draw inside the renderer, render manager, right? You might want to like, in fact, I don't know if we do it yet. Yeah, we don't really. Cool, but I, um, I can definitely see why. Yeah. 
Okay, this is actually a pretty good segue because you, you you mentioned uh, we have two different shaders now, right? Mm -hmm. um, and not only do we have two different shaders, oh, this is an interesting visual artifact here. I was um, just about to. I was like, why is that? Actually, green? you know what it is? Is it's just the it's just the perspective. It's just like a little bit of terrain. Oh, thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it uh, coming through Zoom like that, but Abs absolutely clear now. Okay, that's cool. really. It looked like <laughs> we had the strangest of renderings. Yeah, it did look Oof. a little bit strange. I agree with you. Um, so you mentioned that we have two different shaders now, and it's true. Um, it's not just two different shaders. It's um, it's almost what I would call different render stages or render passes. Hmm. Um, oh, I've I've seen that. I saw that in yeah in the void, whatever RTS had different render stages essentially, and so did that cyberpunk write up. That was really interesting. Yeah, yeah. So generally, when you talk about render passes, uh, you're talking about rendering the same stuff multiple times to get different effects. Mm. Um, uh, I think the dominant way to do 3D graphics in like a AAA game nowadays is to do something called deferred shading, um, which is that you render the scene like seven or eight times for different reasons. Whoa. And so you basically have a bunch of buffers that are the size of the screen uh, containing different kinds of data. Hmm. And then you're, f and then you, you have some final shader that knows how to composite those. And, you know, through some very, very complicated, um, so very, very, very complicated uh, method into the final image. Um, and hmm. it used to be the case that you didn't do that. You maybe run the same shader like multiple times per object, and then draw it into the final final frame buffer. Um, when I was in the game industry, <laughs> this is like a long time ago. This is already like two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Like deferred shading was considered to be like the new hotness, and I think in the intervening decade plus, it's become like the dominant way of doing things. Hmm. So that cyberpunk write up is what you saw. Um, they did multiple render passes, and they basically rendered the whole scene with just like depth information, they render the whole scene with to calculate the metallicness of stuff. They, and it, it's, it's a little bit like, um, they just decided that that was an easier method to reason about rather than combining all the functionality into one like giant Uber shader, they would run a bunch of separate shaders independently and combine the results at the very end. That makes sense. Are, are graphics cards at this point optimized for exactly that thing too, where it's like, um, they must be at yeah. this point. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. They can just push a, a ton of pixels, and they have a ton of memory to handle like full size frame buffers, right? Hmm. Um, so uh, this part of the architecture, I'm not necessarily uh, married to, uh, but this is this is kind of a Rubyism here. Um, basically, I wanted to make sure that we were only like for a particular render stage we were only calling specific functions. So what happens here is this is like a higher order function render standard. So I'd basically, we have two stages now. We have the standard standard stage and the wire stage. Um, it's not called debug draw because I didn't want to have debug draw semantics in the render itself. I just wanted the render to be kind of neutral about what the application would be. Um, but the, right now, the wire stage is just for uh, debug draw. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the way this works is that you p you pass it a function, and that function takes a parameter, which is a draw call, and that draw callback you call once per thing that you're trying to draw for that stage. And because this draw call is different than this draw call, one thing I could have done is just had like a initialized standard phase function that I just called once, mm. and then call a bunch of like render standard thing in order, and then call initialize wire stage, and then call draw wire thing. But I wanted to make sure that you couldn't interleave those in the wrong way, right? I wanted to make sure that like you couldn't call like draw, like initialize standard stage and then call the draw wire thing right after that, right? So I basically use this sort of Ruby looking thing. I guess JavaScript does it too. Like if you wanna, um, I don't know if you've seen uh, like higher order functions that that like do benchmarking. Like it'll t it'll start a timer and then like like capture the the difference between those two things. That's basically what's going on here. Yep, that makes sense. Um, 
And so what the standard stage does here is it uses the standard shader, which is the same one that we, you and I have been working on. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it just sets up culling the same way that hmm. you and I have been doing it before, right? In the depth test. Uh, and then it basically passes in, this is the draw function. And it, this actually, it, it's, it's, it's different than draw function for the, the render wire. So a uh, couple differences between render standard and render wire, right? And once again, um, render standard is the standard stage, render wire is the wire stage. Um, so render wire, Changes the shader, but it also changes the depth, uh, the depth test function. Um, it changes it from less than to less than and equal. Ah, interesting. Yeah, I so, was I was wondering about this because I I actually noticed on mine, I mean this is Safari specific, but I noticed that the grid lines get eaten by the terrain a little bit. Mm. So. Well, that's could be a little bit of floating point error because so we might be seeing some Z fighting a little bit, right? Yeah, it's I should have tried it in Chrome. That's interesting because yours doesn't seem to be doing that at all. Yeah. Well, I don't know. They they, they there's a little bit of artifacting when I on, on my computer when I go back and forth. Sometimes I I swear I'll see a line disappear. Mm. Um. Oh yeah, but, there it uh, is in the brown right there. Yeah, totally. Oh yeah, yeah. You can totally see it right there. Yep. Uh, it really kind of shouldn't be doing that. I think that was the point of this, but maybe I kind of didn't quite succeed yeah, 100%. I, when I was playing around with it, I started changing things to, um, what did I do? I said I said all the line the line models to like 0 0.01 as their like Y value. Yeah. Just to, and in fact, yeah. we, you actually run into that problem anyways, because if you just draw debug draw stuff on top of each other, you're going to run into that problem just within the same vendor mm -hmm. stage. Mm -hmm. um, you, if you can actually tell, I, I don't know if it's visible here, but the, the purple, like, or these magenta tiles that, that draw essentially the hit, the, the, the hit boxes, mm -hmm. they're floating slightly above the ground. I don't know if you can tell, but they're like not quite flush with the grid lines. I can sort of see it on the, uh, the tree to the left where it like, yeah. I... Oh, the no. zoom. Do <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> but no, it, it's like, it's semi-evident that like, yeah, you can see the blue line below the magenta line too, which is nice. Yeah. Can I not just like, okay, it must be at the actual Wait, size. Maybe we need to add that. Well, I wonder if OpenGL even respects that. Uh, I think what happens if we zoom, we're changing the viewport size and like, I think maybe uh, our, our code is too, too, too good. It's too responsive. Um, too responsive. Yeah, you're right. So uh, there was a question last time you and I were talking about like what actually gets written into the depth buffer. And so I looked it up, and the depth buffer contains values from 0 to 1. Uh, and mm -hmm. 0 to 1 measures the distance proportionally between the near plane and the far plane. So if you're flush against the near plane, you're at depth 0. And if you're at the far plane, you're at depth 1. OK. okay. Um, so uh, that has a couple of that has a, a fair, like so some interesting consequences. But uh, one of the interesting things about that is that it basically informs like how what depth function, or like well, it doesn't inform the depth function. But basically, if we were writing z values of zero to one, uh, when we clear the depth buffer, it gets cleared to a value of one for every pixel, uh, which means that anything in front of the far plane can get drawn into the scene. Uh, but then. Th whatever gets drawn there, its Z value gets written into the depth buffer. And so if something fails this function or passes this function, only if it passes this function will it actually get drawn into the scene again. Hmm. Um, so basically what this is saying is that if you have a Z value of less than the value that's already in the depth buffer, we'll draw you and your Z value will replace the old value inside the depth buffer. Oh, interesting. What less than or equal does is it says, um, if your Z value is equal to the current Z buffer value, we'll still draw you. And that's what allows us to have grid lines that are flush up against the ground, even though there's something already drawn there, which is the, the terrain. So if you change that to less right now, we actually, it's it's going to say immediately something's already it at zero. It should yeah. fail, yeah. Interesting. Or maybe do the thing where actually like we see the floating point fighting and like a yeah couple, we might a couple, a couple of lines peek yeah. through but that's it yeah um so the the grid lines look okay but like our oh but what's interesting is the um magenta 
Yeah, or magenta. You can see it flickering right now. It looks pretty rough. Yeah. 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 So that's that's some Z fighting going I on. I see. Right so now. actually what what it gives us is that we're drawing since we're drawing those at a similar level to the grid lines, we get is it just like the later one gets to win? Yeah. Well, I'm a little bit confused. Yeah, exactly. I think you're right. Like the the the, the last one wins because they they're gonna have, they're gonna be rendered with exactly the same values. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know how they're doing floating point comparison and how they're saying less than or equal to, right? Because I think that may be the reason why the grid lines still get to draw is that they're actually like their z values are infinitesimally like closer mm. to the camera than the terrain for whatever reason because they should be exactly the same they should all have like a y value of zero that's weird yeah, yeah it's Neat. a little weird okay um so uh we were talking about the differences between the different render stages mm -hmm. uh one of them is that we use a different depth function so we can draw debug draw over surfaces using the same exact coordinates i mean that's the ideal obviously like it's not 100 percent. we saw like some artifacting in the brown before that you know um, the other thing that's different is that the actual render function that we pass in, it takes different types of objects. This this actually mm -hmm. takes what's called a wire object rather than a model, which the model that you get, it's like a model name, it's position on the XY plane, it's rotation on the XY plane, hmm. uh, which is actually what it used to be. We, we just had like a draw model function before that, that took this exact set of arguments. And now it's just this thing that gets passed into render body. Um, for this debug draw stuff, I wanted the ability to both draw models, which is the same thing as before, uh, only this is actually in full 3D space. You'll notice that this, uh, in the standard phase, this is actually rendering things just in 2D. Um, probably if we get to the business of like having anything that travels in three-dimensional space, they arc, they have some kind of trajectory, we probably just want to like stop fooling around and like make this fully 3D. And so it probably will end up looking like what we do in debug draw here. Cool. Um, this is basically uh, the a wire object is either lines or a model. Let's talk about lines. Lines is basically just a bunch of positions. They're just like pairs of points and a single color. And then a model has a single color. It has an ID of the model. And then it has a bunch of like it has like a full suite of 3D transformation variables if you want to like rotate it or, or, or do something interesting with it, right? Um, so examples of models, wire models are these squares, the, the individual tiles, uh, this yellow cube that we've got here, the grid lines, those are all like basically VAOs that I baked in. And if you look at the render constructor, it actually just loads some models. Gotcha. Yeah. This is just like basic built-in stuff. Um, that looks very similar. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hmm. yeah. Okay. So, uh, that's currently the way it's set up. This is this whole architecture is I guarantee you will change dramatically by the time we're done with it. Um, how we uh, what's interesting is once you change shaders, uh, like the positions of attributes change, right? We can talk about the differences between the wire shader and the standard shader. Oh, right? yeah. One of the things I saw that was interesting there is that the color is a uniform to the wire shader. Um, but a variable in the standard shader. Yeah, you hit the nail sense. on the head. Right. Um, so wire shader here, uh, the colors are uniform because I just figured we'd be drawing primitives that were all of the same color. Mm -hmm. right. Or if we wanted to change the color, we just use a different draw call. We just like make a different object and set, set, set the uniform to be to something different. Um, whereas we have a vertex coloring scheme Right. in the standard shader. Uh, ironically, we don't take advantage of that. <laughs> ironically, I think yet. everything <laughs> yet. Yeah, I, I, I think everything is uniformly colored right now, right? So the tank, these cubes, the turrets, the trees, they're mm -hmm. all a single color right now because all of the vertex colors are exactly the same. Yep. Though yeah. we could, um, if you went into the tree and put a use material call in there, we actually could swap it, that out right now. Like we're allowed to do multiple colors and models as it is. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I do kind of wonder if we're going to end up skipping vertex colors entirely and just start getting into textures. I was wondering that too. I, I thought we might have to like pick up a little 3D model and then sort of see what comes out the other side mm -hmm. and yeah, decide what to do with that. I assume textures were the way. 
Yeah, I, I think typically when you look at what um, most three engines do nowadays, they have a very standard set of parameters in their in their three D objects. But vertex colors aren't part of that, interestingly. Um, and it's because I think the idea of vertex colors is useful if you're doing something very, very basic looking. And it was probably a dominant way of doing 3D rendering in, in, much, much earlier when we were worried about We didn't have textures, for example. Right. We didn't even have texture mapping. Um, but I, I don't think that they're used very much anymore. So most lighting equations, and a lighting equation is just like, what color is my pixel? Mm -hmm. Most lighting equations that you'll see in fragment shaders these days don't, don't even look at the fragment shader. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, they don't, even look, they don't even look at the vertex color. At oh, the vertex color, yeah. yeah. Well, I thought it was interesting because material seems to be about diffuse color and uh, a couple, I, I, it seems like the material concept is more for like, how does the light interact with this object than, exactly. than yeah. like, what do I color the vertex? So that makes yes. sense. Yeah, you have a material which I think presupposes what the shader is doing, uh, but it's mm -hmm. as a bunch of parameters about how this surface responds to light, regardless of what texture is exactly. There. Yeah, yeah. And, and the one of the things that we've left out of our OBJ form right now is the texture coordinates, which are can be represented there, but we just haven't done them. Yeah, and then it also gets a little bit blurry because I feel you can parameterize the lighting equation not just by I guess the text the, the texture is just one of those things and the other thing you can have is like height maps and bump maps and, and those sorts of things that also affect the way that the light effect uh interacts with the the surface as well mm -hmm. um okay um all right so those are the two that's the, i think you actually already talked about the difference between the two shaders the standard shader here uh pretty much the same except that the color is actually now just an input into the shader because we actually output the color Based on the color, the color attribute of the vertex, yep. right? And we potentially expect this to go away. Although, as you're saying, we could technically just like create models that had different colors at different vertices. It's something we know how to do. Yeah, we can. I mean, I feel like we're just going through the history of uh, video game development here. So yes, in in very rapid speed. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh. Okay. So. Whether or not we're going to keep this kind of like render wire versus render standard sort of thing, like th this is the whole art of actually 3D engine architecture is like, how do you structure all this stuff so that it's either easy for artists to change the stuff that they work on without having to like re export everything mm. versus other like standard software engineering con considerations, like how easy is it for me to do something out off the beaten path? You know, um, how you organize this stuff is really kind of like uh, what your program needs and what previous weird decisions you made, you know, like, uh, um, but there's lots of different ways to organize it. Yeah, I, uh, it's interesting how much of this is just up to us in the end, so. Yeah, one of the things I'm, I'm not really, sure about yet and I, and I was thinking this might be f a fun subject among others to like talk to steve about if he, if he wants to come back on the stream mm -hmm. uh would be like which of these gl calls are like cheap to call versus which ones aren't cheap to call right is it expensive to change the shader is it expensive to change a uniform how often should i be able to change a uniform versus changing attributes you know there's all these things that are that are like Right. Kind of opaque and mysterious. And I, ha you know? I have to assume that a uniform is like more expensive than a vertex color, because otherwise you would just change the uniforms as you like step through it. So something in there costs something. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of these calls end up just like it's actually in queuing a command. Hmm. Um, I, I was just looking at through the WebGL APIs, and there's all this like synchronization stuff. Which basically like lets you like say like I want to wait now in my computer in my like browser program for the GPU to finish rendering what all the commands that I've sent it, but the implication there is that all this stuff is actually deferred, hmm. right? It's it, it, all this stuff is just like in queuing the stack of commands that are going off the GPU. Um, Interesting. What? Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no. I'm just 
try to process that. It, ma- it makes sense though, right? Because like we are just feeding a pipeline that's like kind of a different computer living inside our computer. So it, sure. Yeah, it, it does make a lot of sense because like this um, draw arrays function, like it's kind of like IO, right? It's like we're basically saying, hey, other computer, like you were saying, go do this stuff. Mm-hmm. But it's not like the browser program is like waiting for the GPU to come back and say, okay, I did it. Now you can continue, right? Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting how few return values there are available to us throughout this. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. So like, it's not like returning us a, va- a statement that's saying, oh, that draw call succeeded or failed because it like hasn't happened yet by the time right. by the time this this function returns. Hmm. And but I think you can kind of like. If you want to like synchronize what the GPU is doing with what the CPU is doing, you can call these like synchronization functions here. Oh, that's neat. Okay. I think we had talked about it a little bit before, but like you know Vulkan and Metal, which are like the new, the new APIs in mm-hmm. DirectX 12, I mm-hmm. think. Um, uh, they all expose that command queue to you directly, um, rather than abstracting it away behind these function calls. Um, that, the principle being that you want more control. Did, I guess. Yeah, did we look at the Vulcan thing? It really broke my brain. I have not actually look at, looked at the Vulcan API at all. Oh, um, I thought I thought you I thought you even I thought you even sent me something about this. And oh, just, did I? Just how strange it was. It looked totally. Um, well, let's take a look. Developers. I'm a developer. Refer- reference guides, maybe. Reference guides. Yeah. Oh my god. Um, well, Earth. this is just Kronos. Uh, the specification. How about Vulcan? Is there a learnvulcan.com? <laughs> There's learnopenjl.com. Oh, you know, I think this exists. It's but it's the same guy too. That's so funny. Um, getting started. Hello Triangle. Overview. <laughs> Wonderful. I think this is just a placeholder uh, no. right now. Oh, well. Um, but yeah, at any rate, uh, Vulkan's not available to us in the browser yet, so we don't have to worry about it. it doesn't, it's like it doesn't exist. <laughs> Which I am totally fine with, actually. Yeah, I'm fine with it. Yeah, it's more than enough to learn from, from this stuff. Yeah. Um, okay, so we've covered debug draw. We've covered um, the structure of the render. We've stru- t- covered the structure of the client. Hmm. Um, we have covered re- the restart hotkey. What else has changed? I get occasional flickers here, which I think is Z fighting. I don't, I, you probably can't I'm even tell. I'm not really seeing yeah. it. Yeah. If you if you give the wire model just a 0.01 height, does it fix it for you? It will probably fix yeah. it. Yeah. I think that that'll fix it for me too. Yeah. Um, okay. What else has changed? I would look at the commit log, but I've made a bunch of tiny commits, so it's not quite as useful. I mean, this this seems like a, a pretty comprehensive. You got a lot of stuff in here. That's great. Yeah. Um. Th- I mean, the thing is, functionally, nothing's changed really. I mean, I, I fixed a couple of bugs, and then like our our like our shooting, our aiming is now perspective correct. Mm-hmm. Um. Oh, I mean, I can talk about like you can barely tell, but there are actually different colored boxes hit boxes for the bullets and the different colors actually represent different simulation phases Uh, okay and and, and so a simulation phase uh that's cool where did i invent the concept of simulation phase yeah that's a new addition yes uh and it's not that it's it's actually nothing new um Yes. So I basically said that there are different types of simulation. There's like the server tick. There is the client prediction. There's the client authoritative simulation, which is basically the client playing back with the server told it to play back. And there's client reprediction, which is replaying all frames prior to the current one, but ahead of the author- the committed frame. Right? So just looking at that in in a client sim, you can see the whole life cycle there. Um, so, when we're in the update, or when we're in the tick, rather, 
the simulation that we call after handling input is in the client prediction phase. That's just like the current frame that we're, we're, we're on. We're on simulating ahead of the, the server. Mm -hmm. Inside sync server state, um, when we simulate server messages, that's this one here, right? We mm -hmm. undo the prediction. And for each one of those update frames that we get from the server, um, we call that a client authoritative simulation. Uh, and then this is the loop where we say, OK, everything beyond the committed frame before the current frame, uh, we're going to call that reprediction. And I just pass it into the simulate function as part of the sim state object. And I'm really, really hoping that none of our actual game logic will care about this. But I, I, I decided that maybe debug draw cares. Right. D d maybe debug draw will care like, mm. like what the server version of the player looks like versus the the, the, the player version, right? Um, if you if you go back and watch that uh, that Overwatch multiplayer video that we we sort of based our multiplayer design off of, mm -hmm. like there are some there are some shots of that where they show like what is the server's impression of where the player is versus where the, where is the players, and so. I thought like, well, maybe some of our debug draw will care about what phase we're currently in. Hmm. And this may be something that we could maybe put into the debug draw object instead of like just like passing it in there. But I'm really hoping that like none of our actual logic cares that it's like doing prediction as opposed to like authoritative stuff. Gosh, but it might. I mean, we started to kind of like add a sense of that with the particle emitter stuff, right? Like we didn't necessarily want reprediction to yeah, particles, that right? seems, it seems like a really nice way to handle that. That's really yeah. cool. Uh, are you saying the, the dependency injection way of doing it or actually uh, passing in the just, literal? Just things? passing it in, yeah. Just having, having a nice explicit track for that everywhere feels yeah. really good. Yeah. Um, so that's there just so that we can draw different colors. So the green that you're seeing there is... Is, is is actually lagging the bullet because that's actually the the green is the server, is this the, the authoritative? Uh, I don't think you can. Can you see the green at all? Mm, very very barely. Okay, so it's like, it's super faint, but there's basically like a red, there's a red square, an orange square, and a green square. Um, and the green square is is committed, which is like it's what the server, it's it's where the server is. Um, gotcha. And then the red square is the uh, hmm. the server is the client prediction and then the orange square is the reprediction that's so cool yeah um huh that that ended up not being quite as useful as i wanted it to be but um you can also see it in the in the tank's hitbox although I, you can barely see the tank's hitbox under the tank itself but there's like oh, I can't a see tiny all, bit of yeah. red popping out but there's definitely a green one and it's the green one is lagging the tank the furthest oh, because that's where the I server see. is yeah yep yep, yep. interesting yeah. Um, Man, that's, okay, that's cool. uh, so that's kind of where we're at after a week off uh, and a ton of refactoring. I mean, I, mean, I think after, after last stream, we kind of had a lot of stuff that we needed to go back and delete, and I think we're... So we're kind of now in a healthy state to, like, break everything again. Yeah. <laughs> Do it. It's, you know, the game is just working too well. Yeah. <laughs> Time to go to town. Yes. Um... I was gonna say, I recall, I recall one of the last things we were we were looking at too. Um, yeah, was lighting. Was lighting. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that's actually kind of like a good thing to discuss right now, which is like stuff that we could be working on. Lighting is a big one. Mm -hmm. um, the other one I thought about were particles and three D. That'd be really cool. Particles are tricky because a lot of them have alpha. Uh, we might not do alpha uh, right oh. now, but um, hmm. the reason why alpha is hard is you remember that whole Z buffer thing that I talked to you about, mm -hmm. or the depth buffer? Mm -hmm. Same thing. Z buffer, depth buffer, they're synonymous. Um, the algorithm is is really nice, and it, it saves us from having to do any kind of like in, 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 in any kind of sorting in our game logic. Like we don't have to like order things from front to back. Um, if something is kind of angled with respect to the camera, we don't have to worry about if there's an object that's both in front and behind of an, another object, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can imagine, like, if I'm standing in front of a building that is, like, oblique, like, it's kind of like at an angle, 
I'm actually both in front and behind the building, right? Um, and if we, we if we didn't have the Z buffer, we'd have to like split the building into like a bunch of different pieces of geometry. Some that would draw behind me, and some that would draw in front of me, right? So the depth buffer is amazing, but you can't use it for trans translucent stuff or transparent stuff, right? Because with transparent stuff, you have to know whether a transparent thing is in front of or behind an opaque thing. Because if you draw the transparent thing first and it actually populates the Z buffer, uh, the thing behind it won't draw and you won't get the transparency. Oh, effect. but you can't like universally draw particles first if they're behind something else and apply that yeah. rule. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Huh. So generally what happens is all, everything with an alpha value that is not one, just gets drawn in a completely separate stage. So you just like draw the whole scene without alpha, mm -hmm. and then everything that has alpha you draw in a separate stage. But then if you have multiple things that stack with alpha, then you're in trouble. Then you have to like actually figure out what's uh, what's in front of it. Right? That's really interesting. And particles are kind of like patient zero of alpha hell, basically, <laughs> right? Because like. A lot of particles are like fire and that kind of thing. And you kind of want to be able to see through it, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh. Um, but if we want to make particles a bunch of like opaque quads and triangles, we could just do, do that too and just call it a day. Like we don't have to have alpha in our in our particles. I mean, let's let's start with little triangles because yeah. yeah, that sounds hard. <laughs> um, cried. Another thing that I've been thinking about that would help a lot is animation. Um. Mm. And animation in 3D is a whole, <laughs> as gnarly as everything has been so far, mm -hmm. I think animation is actually harder than all the visual things that we've done. It's not harder than multiplayer, I don't think. Like, multiplayer has, like, I don't think it's harder than multiplayer. I, I think just, multiplayer is, like, the hardest thing, like, conceptually. Just based on what we did, I'm just like, we can do anything now. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, <laughs> I know what you mean. Like, I feel like 3D graphics ends up being, like, uh, like you can just stack the concepts on each other and you can build up like a whole kind of corpus of knowledge. Whereas like with multiplayer, you kind of have to get it right. The, you kind of have to get the basic architecture right. And there's a lot of things you have to design into the basic architecture. To, and so it's like kind of like a harder fundamental problem and a lot hangs off of early decisions that you make. And determining correctness is also a real challenge. It's, it's a real challenge, yeah. Um, but kind of sitting in between the graphical stuff that we've done so far and multiplayer, mm -hmm. sitting in between those two things on the difficulty scale, I think is, is animation. Um, and partly it's just because it's like a lot of data. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'd also have to just like learn how to use animation programs. Um, I, you know, it's interesting because I, I, I guess, yeah, it, there, there's a couple of things there. One is like us generate our own animations and i'm sure we could get more crappy free models like the tree in the tank yeah but yeah having like our engine needs to be parsing animations and i was thinking about the decay you have on the debug draw where actually like animation seems like it's a just a what i assume is a rotating index into some set of coordinates right like yeah at, at least for looping animation so so i i think actually that what you just talked about is the way that i would suggest we do animation up front mm -hmm. which is that um with animation, I think what we have to talk about is maybe separating our... Right now, our models are actually single... Are essentially single surfaces or single meshes, mm -hmm. right? Um, there are sort of like rigid bodies that move around, right? And you know, our tank is animating in terms of its world rotation, mm -hmm. but it's not actually... An like the wheels aren't rolling, nor is the turret moving. You can barely see the turret. Let's see if I can get a view with the turret right. kind it's, of poking out. It's like sort of in there. Yeah. Yeah. You can see the turret kind of poking out the top side of the tank right now, but it's not rotating, mm -hmm. right? Um, so what we actually need to do is to actually have an, a notion of a model that is actually composed of multiple meshes. Mm -hmm. And the meshes can have a relationship to each other that, that can change over time. Either they rotate or translate or, or, or there's some, there's some matrix-driven relationship between those two meshes. Now is right. that is that how rigging works as well? Like I was thinking that the tank is actually just an object with two rigging points, like a bottom and a top, and the top yeah. one just rotates. 
Is that yeah. bizarre? Yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. So I, I think like the way that I, I, I thought we might um, deal with this is that we'd have some way of representing the fact that like we've got like the turret mesh and mm -hmm. the, the body mesh uh, and they have a relationship to each other such that like the turret is actually some translation and some orientation off of the base of the t the, the tank. Yep. Uh, and then we specify some degree of freedom that the turret has relative to the body. And we need to put a constraint on the degree. Well, it doesn't have to be a constraint. We can just say like, I would like to now pass in a parameter mm -hmm. that applies a rotation to the turret relative to its base. Mm -hmm. And so essentially a, a transformation that stacks on top of the base transform that that, tur that turret had, the turret mesh had with the base mesh. Um, and basically we just pass in, for example, like we wanted to just rotate it. We just pass in a, either a quaternion or even just like an Euler, an Euler angle rotation, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that might get us pretty far. Uh, I think the way that actual animation systems work uh, is that they use keyframe animation. Uh, mm -hmm. And the keyframe animation is basically you have an animation, which is just like a, like a multi-second or half a, or just some length of time. And you have that length, they have that span of time subdivided into what are called keyframes. Basically just like for every single, um, every single like mesh in my, in my body here, I want to basically snapshot where all those meshes are relative mm -hmm. to the center of the body or center of the model. And then I basically just like um, keyframes in traditional like cell animation, like hand-drawn animation are basically like the primary action points, um, but they're not once every 24 frames. It might only be like once every 12 frames or once every six frames or something like that. And right. then what you do is like, at least in, in like hand-drawn animation, you'd pass off the keyframes to some lackeys and they would go in and fill in the intermediate frames. I always wonder if that's exactly what happened and that sounds terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, now the lackeys that you pass it off to in the uh, 3D graphics world is in just linear interpolation, yep. right? So you basically just like interpolate between the keyframes. However, you have to do linear interpolation on 3D surfaces, right? So if you're sort of like, if you're doing like linear interpolation of rotations, mm -hmm. Um, a linear interpolation uh, like has to like smoothly follow the curve of a sphere as opposed to just like a straight line motion. And Ooh. that is mathematically hard to do. That makes sense, yeah. Um, there's a whole uh, notion of slurps, uh, which is called a spherical linear interpolation. Oh, wow. Um, and it actually ends up to do it like 100% accurately is a ton of math. Um, and there's a whole kind of uh, sub school of knowledge on how to cheat this math, like basically how to approximate slurp yeah, with that's something funny. that's fast. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think kind of what I'm proposing is that we don't do keyframe animation up front. Okay. Uh, if we don't have to. Um, now. Of course, a lot of a, what a lot of animation packages will export as keyframe animations. If we wanted to like let an artist define an, a whole animation, mm -hmm. right? Is they they would do keyframes, and not only does it allow you to do keyframes, but it allows you to do blending between animations. So you can basically say like, I want sixty percent run and forty percent walk. Oh, right? I've seen that. Yeah, that's really cool. It's very very cool. Yeah, um, and you know it's it's kind of how you can do kind of smooth transitions between different animations mm -hmm. um and uh i mean I, I don't know if manchester will ever get there i mean i'd be happy if we could just rotate the turret right I, I mean let's be real yeah. we're, we're in the browser yeah <laughs> well, right when we when we write this language natively in rust or this engine natively in rust then i'd be like okay we got the bandwidth for that yeah and whatever that game was called that we were just look like the article we were reading today. I forget what it was. It was Phobos.org, but like I don't remember what it, it was. It was void, void something. Void something. Yeah. It was really cool. Um, the way they did animation was not kind of like keyframe animation in the traditional sense. They literally just had like separate 
meshes for the different I thought types. that was a really yeah. clever solution. Yeah, it's very clever, <laughs> and it's it's totally viable given the size of those meshes, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so we'd just be like literally loading a different tank every time we'd like aim or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, that's probably not what we're going to do. We probably want a smoothly rotating turret. Yep. Um, so I think animations definitely would, would help a lot, and then I think textures, of course, would help a lot. Right. Textures, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. If okay. we do, if we end up doing textures, right? Like we, we might decide that wireframe. Uh, e uh, even like wireframe even if we wireframe, wireframe, I feel like we might do some light texturing. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. That's some stuff. That's a lot of shit. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I think once we kind of have this down, like maybe we're we'd be we'd be in a good place to like actually start to think about what the long-term visual style of the game will actually be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do any of those so, jump at you right now? Uh, I mean, they're all they're all good. Um, I I feel like without lighting, it might be hard to differentiate between different surfaces, even if we animate. That's that's my feeling too. Um, like the tank is black, but actually, like if it was lit, we could even see what's going on. Yeah. Okay. And I think it'll make stuff like the turret much more painful. The fact that the fact that sorry the fact that turret's not moving will hurt us more. We'll, yeah. we'll be annoyed looking at it. Okay, so do we want to make every model in our standard stage lit, or do we want to add another stage that that can handle lit models? Ah, because right, we don't have vertex normals for everything yet, but we could, right? We have vertex nor we don't we don't have normals. We do have normals, right? We have all the OBJ files, right? Yeah, I, th I thought we had normals for everything actually. Okay. Maybe not the cube, but that's the easiest one to reconstruct. Exactly. Uh, that's not the wrong. We have too many files called tree. I know. I don't um, think the normals made it in here. He, I stripped it out of this shit. Oh, we can we can get them for this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, cool. But we had, what we about have, the, we uh, have for the tank, right? Yeah. We had a cooler tank, I thought. Um, this is like the dopey looking four wheel tank, like, right? Yeah, this this is dopey, but also it's a little charming. <laughs> okay. Oh, hey, here either. Um, so the other thing about these models mm -hmm. is that they're the way that they are exported and where they are supposed to be facing. Um, it's a little bit problematic right now because I actually asked around. Um, I asked in an, an, another Discord channel with with some of my uh, some of my friends who I met in the game industry, um, and I asked like you know like what is the standard when you export a, a mo like a model in its T pose? Like mm -hmm. it, is the front of it facing down the positive Z axis or the negative Z axis? Mm, or like, what, what is the question. standard yeah. for that? Um, and they basically just told me there is no standard. Fuck. <laughs> Nobody can agree on it. Um, so the advice, actually, Steve gave this to me. Steve said that the, what he would recommend us do is like whatever model that we get, open it up in whatever 3D editor of your choice and export it and like flip it and orient it the way that you expect it to be. That makes sense. And then re-export it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, and and that, that was the fundamental problem with the tank, right? Is the, the tank actually is driving backwards, right? You can yeah. kind of see, or, 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 or sideways. I, I don't know what, it's backwards, right? I'm driving south. But the turret is facing north that's, right now. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, or actually, what's interesting is, does the turret seem like it's? I don't know what's going on with the turret right now. Um, Tur the turret's the not, turret's it's not doing anything. It's having a bad time. Yeah, I think it's just our perspective right now is is such that you can only see the turret hanging off the back mm -hmm. when it's facing this way. But it is, but it is pointed the opposite direction. It is pointed the opposite direction. So our whole our our, our tank is driving backwards right mm -hmm. now, um, and. It's not the fault of the model itself. It is the it is a problem that our the model disagrees with the orientation that we expect, right? Yep. Like yep. we basically treat the front of our rotations as pointing or, or, or our rotation system is such that the front of any model should be facing north or down the negative z axis, right? Mm -hmm. um, someone someone named Ensholler popped in the chat and said salve, and I'm not sure what that means or if they're still there, but salve back at you. Salve, like yeah. S A L V E. Yeah, is that greetings oh. and something I don't understand? 
Maybe they're firing an open. Yeah, I mean that's that's what I thought of it. I mean, it is a common English word, but you yeah. know, there could be. Maybe there's a, there's a university called Salve. Maybe or, or maybe we college. should be throwing some salvos. Well, okay. Salvage you, buddy. Yeah. And I think they're gone, so who knows? Okay. Were you a robot? Good questions. Uh, do, do, do you want to buy a salve right now? Like, did the, the, if it's if it's if it's like trying to spam us, it should at least be like reasonable spam, right? Which makes you think it's a human sending sending a friendly message. I see. Okay. Yeah. Cause yeah. No one. No one offered um, to sell me anything. Boy, the lack of particles really kind of like we, did, we we lost a lot of sizzle and we lost the particles, right? It's true. It's yeah. true. I mm, well, since since we need to redo all our models, maybe. Yeah, and we might need, okay. we might need to learn some Blender. Uh, yeah, we 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 are gonna need to learn Blender for sure. Yeah. Um, where is my notes? What else? But Blender is good though. It's not bad. I also thought having a level level editor in 3D would be a nice thing eventually. Hmm. Yeah. I you know I'd be interested in also just level generation the way that guy did it. Um, mm -hmm. If we want to just have a map that we could like throw a seed and have it spit out the same noise every time. Yep. Yep. A very expansive topic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely. Not gonna be easy problem. <laughs> um, but it, it's an easy way to get content, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's talk a bit about the models. Okay. Um, do we remember where the where we got the tank? What was the the three D site that that you were downloading stuff oh, from? Yeah, let me find it. It was crap. <laughs> it was a really bad site. Okay. Uh, Fubj. I think I got it from yeah cgtrader.com. Yeah, <laughs> it's the first one that came up when I googled you free three D models. Um, and now you gotta hit that hit that low poly, yeah. Yeah, it's like an attribute to low poly. Um, it's a little clearer. Hang on. Oh, I'm seeing. I mean, I'd be happy with any of these. Yeah, I think this is the one that we were thinking about at one point. I like that better than what we got now. I, I do too. Um, yeah, so we could run with that. I think ours looked a little bit like this kind of like World War One, oh, but even worse. Yeah. Sorry, with four wheels. Sorry, whoever. Oh, there's a cute model. little dog with a shoe. Let's do that. <laughs> this is like a Monopoly piece or something. <laughs> um, okay, let's just grab this. And are we gonna just like? Download Blender right now. Is that what's gonna? Is that what's gonna happen? I, I think so. Let's do it. I mean, we, right. we might as well. I say I'm downloading. Free download. it. I'm downloading Blender for the M1 and hoping I can get it. Oh yeah. We'll find, I mean, we'll find out. Every, everything usually works. I'm not that worried. This is legit. Maybe the reason why I get another computer is because of Blender, right? Mm hmm. Blender's an actual company. It's cool. I think they're in Amsterdam or something like I, that. I really like Blender. Um, yeah. I, I sort of have noodled on it in the past as just a, like, uh, it'd be really fun to, like, learn how to do some 3D stuff. Uh, it's really cool and, like, shockingly intuitive. Yeah. And I think they, they frequently compare it to, like, Maya. I'm just like, oh, yeah, not, not that. No, thank you. I use 3D Studio Max in a heavily customized format. Uh, for one of the games I worked on. Mm. And then the other company that did 3D graphics that I worked at, like I didn't even touch the 3D system at all. How oh, funny. Uh, and they used Maya. Maya feels like the thing very frequently. Uh, 12 years ago, it was the, 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 the considered to be the best. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now, now I see these 3D programs and they're like competing with like what level of hair fidelity they can offer. And I was just like, man, right. this, is, this is too much. Yeah. All right, well, Blender is Whew. opening as we speak. I say, mine did not download that fast. Dang. All right, there we go. Uh, shortcuts select with left face bar, <laughs> dark, light. I like that one of the themes is Maya. <laughs> what?
What is XSI? Deep gray. I'm going light mode. It's just just a theme here. Do it. Um. So I just downloaded something. Did I download this? I haven't even got it yet. Mm, uh, yet. Oh, wow. It's a whole freaking thing. So there's, uh, there is a Blender file there, which is cool. Yeah. Um, oh, I need to make like a whole account and everything, right. don't I? Let me see if I have one. No, it's cool. I'll do it. OK. I'm going to register. Yeah, we've given CG Trader a lot of free business, so. All right. Yeah, this thing totally works. Dude, it is wild to me that fucking Blender for Intel just works on this computer. <laughs> it really shouldn't. So I um I bought rental insur uh renter's insurance the other day. Okay. It felt like a very adult thing for me to do. I I I you know I feel very safe with my renter's insurance, so I think that's a great yeah. How do I make this like not show my password so that I'm not streaming my password uh, on screen? <laughs> I have no clue. All right, well everyone is going to know my password from here on out. That's for, fine. For CG Trader. Or for CG down. Trader, yeah. <laughs> Congratulations world. You've got me. <laughs> oh, I actually have to confirm my email address. That's hilarious. I love it. I was going to say, we should also, um, if we want to ever use not free models, I would love to patronize some itch creators. Oh, yeah, totally. Uh, Just because. How do I copy this link? Copy link location. That's such a weird way of describing that. Just like copy the link. <laughs> Welcome to the community. Um, all right. So how do I get back to my tank? There we go. I love its epic polytune tank. Is it downloading? Oh, it's being prepared. This this seems seems rather <laughs> suspect, doesn't it? <laughs> um, literally, I'm gonna spend the next sixty minutes fumbling around in Blender. Like I I, I really don't know. It's you you and me both. Up we're, from down. We're yeah. we're gonna be okay. Uh, I I believe in us. I think it's a worthwhile endeavor. Yes. Yeah, I'm doing the same. I'm trying to load a different tank into a different Blender. Open. Okay. Uh, wow, it made it. Um, so how do I how do I move around? How do I rotate? Ah. Um, so I I use the touchpad. Will give you three D motion if you've got access to that. Uh, I don't. Okay. Then I maybe if I hold shift. Uh, or maybe if you're using a mouse, middle click. And drag. Oh yes, there middle click and drag. There we go. Uh huh. All right. So, what are our axes right now? Ah, so if you click on tank root. Oh, I see it. I see it. It's actually just covered up by our zoom. Um, we've got X, uh -huh. Y, and Z. Uh -huh. So they're using Z as up. So that's a problem, right? Ah, that is a problem. Yep. Yeah. So we can we can we can kind of rotate this stuff. Yeah. Um, well, and and check out uh, tank root. So in the scene collection on the right, you can click on the actual object to mess with the transforms specifically. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Cool. So let's get our bearings here really quickly. I'm just trying to get a sense of. I'm just looking at this X Y Z, uh, mm -hmm. like this sort of uh, basis vector diagram here. Yeah. Their positive y. I'm trying to think of. Okay, yeah. So it is an OpenGL uh, orientation. If you kind of twist your head, uh, if you see that kind of faded. This this dot right here. That's the negative z. Mm -hmm. Um, that is north, in Manchester, right? That negative z is north. North. Okay. And then. 
positive x is east mm -hmm. and positive y is up. So this, this is actually the, this is the arrangement of the axes that we want. Um, because you could, you could, you could, you could have z, positive z be this, this one down here. It's like arbitrary, like we don't wish oh, we can flip them around, right? Yeah, but I guess, I guess what's going to be weird for this is that the, the entire editor seems to be oriented around positive z being up. I don't think it has to be though. Okay. Um, it's just the way that this is currently oriented. Because like, right, we could just like we could do this if we wanted to. Yeah, well, I guess I'm thinking like there's a there's like sort of a built-in ground plane that the editor is just. But the editor wants us to use it this way at least. Um, there might be ways of changing that, right? Yeah, totally. um, which is basically like <laughs> what's going to take us an hour to figure out. Um, well. Is it a is it like a editor level thing or is it just a model? I would think it'd be just like a model level thing, right? That's a great. The editor shouldn't be that opinionated about it. I really like this UI actually. It's, it looks good. I uh, Blender. I yeah. Oh, here you go. Is it possible to make Blender a Y up world? This is unique to Blender, as far as I know. This cannot be changed. Well, that sucks. Huh. Blender uses a right hand coordinate system with the Z axis pointing upwards what most 3d cad programs use huh that complicates things a lot um because it, it's not I, I, i'm not just worried about translating the vertices mm -hmm. like all the vertex normals have to be re-angled as well and that's a hard problem or and it's not it's just like it's not it's not trivial to do oh that's annoying like we don't just have to like before when we wanted to like move our tank model around and flip it around we just applied a transformer rotation to it right mm -hmm. uh but or we and we also scaled it as well all the basic stuff is fine but when you have to actually apply that to every single normal as well that starts to get a little bit dicey hmm uh, this is really interesting and it seems like this is sort of Let's see i'm re i'm reading uh like how to import Blender into Unity, which I assume also is Y up. I mean, I guess, yeah, I guess people are just saying rotate the model in Blender. Like you just work with it on a funny axis. Oh, okay. You can't, uh, you can't globally change it, but also that's fine. Okay. So now if we were to take this model, did you get an OPJ or a Blender file? You this get, is a Blender file. So if we exported this to an OBJ, load it into our thing, we should immediately see a straight up and down tank, right? Uh, if we ex exported this to to OBJ, we would see a or a facing down tank that looks like. Let me see if I can do this. <laughs> um, oh hit! Uh, hit. Oh yes, yes. So this is, yeah, kind of it. Okay. Yeah, we look like this. Yep. Does it make sense what I did right there? Yeah. You can see the axes. Mm -hmm. It's sort of hard to get to do exactly what I want, but what we want is X pointing to the east, negative Z pointing to the north, and positive Y pointing straight up. So we'd have basically a, a tank that's pointing straight up out of the ground. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what you're talking about, right? Straight yeah. up and down. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we could mess with the rotations of tank root. Tank root, right? Yeah, correct. Uh, all right, getting warmer. So I assume, is it just zero on X there? Cool. And then if we want to, we want him facing north, right? 180 around this. Actually, I wanted 180 around the y axis. Yeah. Right, because 180 around the z is what you would have thought in a y up world, but we're not. We're in a z up yes. world. Yes. So I think this would be mm -hmm. the tank as we would want it. Okay. And I guess, yeah, I was going to say, should we export it and see what we get? Yeah. Okay. And we're just exporting an OBJ now. Yeah. Yeah, if this is. If this Can is go ahead and just pipeline. like save it. Save as. Sure. 
Uh, and... <laughs> Man. The, the, these are, uh, they rewrote the whole GUI library. <laughs> these are not Mac native controls here. Oh yeah, I, I assume this is Java. <laughs> oh yeah. It's or it could be cute. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we're gonna export it as a Wavefront OBJ. And it's got GLTF in here, which I think eventually we should get to. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah, 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 totally. The reason why I like GLTF is that I don't think OBJ has a notion of multiple multiple uh, meshes. I You're right, and I think the, especially for a primitive animation, it works really well for GLTF. Yeah. Well, that was an adventure. I think we've got an OBJ file now, though. Right. Let's, um, let's see, yeah. And... This is actually oh you know what it is is because I'm in I'm in the remote editor uh, cancel I need a new window and I want downloads there's an OBJ extension shit let's do it it's super cool. <laughs> Is this the one that has 3.js in it? This is the one I was complaining about, yeah. <laughs> nice. So I'm just going to take this wholesale. Uh huh. And I'm going to put it into tank.ts. Tank.ts. Tank .ts. Bam. Oh, uh, actually, uh, uh, yeah. we kind of want to keep this stuff, right? It'd be nice if we. I would love to get to the point where we can import OBJs just into a string and drop them into this format a little more easily. Yeah, maybe can can we just do import from tank.obj and have parcel give us a string out? Parcel will do that, yeah. Um I think we should just do that. Especially just in a, yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you that like this this needs some work. Ah, and also here's a fun one. I yep. I see a quad in there. Uh you see a quad. Yeah, I see some of those Fs are four points instead of three. Some are three. Oh, interesting. I think we can. I think we can sort that out. Yeah, we can sort that out. Yeah, but we need to teach the renderer what to do with that. Yes. Okay. Uh, oh, this is going to be. That's a big. At least model. there's not. At least there's not. Wait, is that five? What? Okay, so that's that's going to be a little bit challenging. My my understanding is that that is a triangle strip. Okay. Yeah, I, I was reading up like, what does it mean when you see four or more in a line? And I don't, I can't for the life of me figure out why they would do that. <laughs> um, I think it's just in case you wanted to like draw in an optimized way. Mm. Uh, wave front OBJ format. Is this the right file? Is this the right thing to be looking at? Um, yeah, yeah, totally. Face elements. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, if you want to, if we want to go GLTF, and this is just getting weird, like we can just switch. Uh, we could. That would just be a lot of typing. Um, yeah. But this would be a lot of typing. This is gonna be some typing. This is gonna be some typing. Um, well, okay. I was like, what maybe... if we just ignore the faces that have multiple? I mean, it's not that it, it's a lot of them, but like if we if we go as is, we're just going to draw triangles instead of quads there, and it's fine. Oh yeah, like you're we're, totally right. We're just not going to draw the rest of the shape it wants. Yeah, we'll have totally right. we'll have holes in the model. You're totally right. Um, so let's just take a look at what it looks like right now in the yeah. game. Right, yeah, it should totally. just be running. Mm -hmm. Right, did that did that recompile? Oh, it's not running. Oh. Wait, you're on the second console. Is there a? You're in your debug console. What's in the first shell? This one? This is the cloud dev. Uh, no, in in um, VS Code, where it says in your bottom panel, it says two oh, no debug. I have yeah. two. Yeah. What in the hell? When you hit the when you hit the debug button, it um, started you a new shell session. 
Interesting. Yeah. It's that's uh, weird. It's helpful? Question mark. Yeah. Uh, this remote SSH thing maybe has a couple of things that are weird about it. Oh, I mean that that's just bog standard VS Code stuff. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, so my tank isn't drawing right now. Yeah, uh, I love it. Okay, any console errors? Oh, I can really see the hitbox uh, trailing there. Though. That's cool. Yeah. Console looks good. Okay. The console looks good. Um, <clears throat> so how do we want to approach this? If we were to look at the... Is it our scale is way too small? I was going to say, I'm curious if the vertices are... They're oriented around one, yeah, and we have this... It's one over 192. Yeah. So let's actually just change this to one for now. That right? seems reasonable. And maybe translate can be a zero. Yeah, can we get rid of this entirely? I think this is optional. That'd be great. Yeah. Oh, no, it's formatting it. Boy, that last model was weird. Okay, still reloading. Yeah. Oh my god. Okay, so <laughs> this is really weird. It's rotated wrong. Yeah, it is. I think uh, I think if we undid I don't know why, but I have this thing in my head where like I feel like the OBJ that Blender spits out would have been correct without us rotating. Does that seem is that stupid? Uh no. I don't know why though. So what you're proposing No, oh, what's going on here? Um, what you're proposing is that I undo these changes. Yeah. Yeah, take a, take us back to normal town. Uh, nice. And we're in normal town. Uh, so, actually, this I really there's one really great thing going on here, which is you can actually see that it's like four tiles wide by six tiles long. Oh yes. And it's yep. its units seem to be matching our map units, which is great. Yeah. Uh, so should we scale it down right now too before we re-export it? Uh, we can definitely do that. Uh, can we scale this in a uniform way? Is there a way to do that? I'll just 0 0.25. So, yeah, and I'm not actually sure what I'm doing here. Is this going to affect the OBJ file that I export? It should. OK. So far, I like this program. It pl it has not a ton of bullshit going on, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh huh. God, I love that it's like 300 kilobytes of data, and OpenGL is just like, yeah, whatever, don't worry about it. As as that uh, post was saying, like it's like, oh no, we threw 12 megabytes at the graphics card. What will it do? Uh, does our thing handle these weird? Yeah, it just. It just ignores them. Yeah, it just looks for the first character of the line being V or F right now, or VN. Okay. All right. I'm really curious what that did. Man. Yes, Lint sucks. It really does. It shouldn't have a hard time with an 8,000 line file, right? No, it's, it's quite dumb. Yeah. Oh, -ho. Nice. very interesting. It is yeah, just backwards. It's just backwards. It's having a hard time drawing, but uh, uh, I see. You know, I see the bones of a tank in there. Yeah, I do see. I, I see a bones of a tank in there too. Yeah. Um, I see. I see a tank that can be lit. I. I, <laughs> I do too. Can we try to get it? Uh, what should we? We should rotate it around its. Its z-axis. Yeah. One eighty. Yep. Yeah. And let's see if that will get us mm -hmm. to the promised land. Huh? I like that it doesn't ask you if you wanted to overwrite that file. It's just like no. No, it's you wanted yeah. It's too good you're for just, that. You're going for it. Okay. I don't quite trust BS code for reloading that file. I'm just gonna open it again. That's fair. Yeah. Oh, it is, you know, it is interesting. Um, you see how there's like an O line there? There's O tank cube. That, this one? Yeah, that actually, if you look for other lines that start with O, that actually is the submodel designation. Oh, here. so it's, we can actually do sort of meshes then. Yeah, uh, we can, we could, if we wanted to rotate the turret, we actually could probably find that in here. Mm -hmm. Oh, we 
Totally could. Yep. Uh, we'll take tower. Is that? I saw tower and I barrel, and it's probably like those. It's probably the barrel. Two. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> There's no hierarchy here, though, right? Um, where in GLTF has has hierarchies. Yeah. What's the fucking wild thing about this is that you just go top to bottom and like spray and pray. Yeah. Yeah. You, you do need basically a sense of your 3D models being a hierarchy of meshes, like a tree of meshes, mm -hmm. and, and like each sub mesh has a matrix relationship with its parent. Yep. Uh, all right. Oh my god. Cool. Oh Jesus. Yeah, that looks great. <laughs> It looks amazing. Uh, what the hell just happened? Were we, were we maybe doing the translation in our parsing? Have we done that already? Maybe. Is oh. it just that when we export to OBJ? Mm -hmm. Well, no. I mean, that's why I can't figure out. Yeah, these are the three dimensions, right? It's X, Y, and Z, right? Like it should just Blender should just do what we want. It's interesting that some of those Zs are negative. Huh. I feel like it. I feel like it for some reason export what we wanted. Maybe because it's an OBJ. Yeah. Are you saying that OBJ has the orientation that we want? Yeah. It's like when they export to OBJ, they're just like, okay, cool. Like flip the Y and Z. We know. What, we know what they expect of this one. That's the only explanation that makes sense to me. Yeah, our renderer doesn't do this, right? Or our model loader or whatever it is. I don't think so. Yeah. Um, Cuz clearly the modifications that we make here affect what is exported, right? It's this isn't just like a local thing inside Blender. Yeah. It's affecting the yeah. export. Yeah. And you rotate it along the Z and ours rotated around Y. So you know whatever it is it's doing the right thing. Yeah. Mm, quite a mystery. Mhm. Mm at any rate, we have a correctly oriented tank now, yeah, which do. is highly gratifying. Whew. It almost feels cool now. It, Boy, these trails look good. When we have actual particle effects for these. I know. I like that you've like made fake particle effects, but they're yeah. sick. Yeah. And I can shoot the trees. Boy, it doesn't get any doesn't get old, does it? <laughs> <laughs> um Okay. What's next? Uh sh well. Should we finish the drawing the tank? <laughs> yeah, we should actually finish the, the, the quads, maybe. Yeah. How do we handle quads? I think it's just um, so. Let's see. Let's let's go to the place where we parse this, which is like. Uh yeah. Model OBJ quads. How to convert to? I want to convert from. Mm. OBJ polygons to triangles. Oh man, wait, could Blender do this for us? Because that would just be. Oh, that would be dope. I saw a triang triangulate option. Is this going to be the easiest thing? What is this? I have no idea. Meshes, mesh faces triangulate. Select all the faces. Oh boy. Uh, this is the selection tool, I'm guessing. No. Scale, transform, annotate, measure, scale, move, cursor. Nope. How about select all? Oh, there's a select button literally right here. All. And modeling, maybe? Whoa. Do you see a mesh uh, looking icon here? No. What is world properties? Huh. Okay, let me let me go back to this. Oh, it says wait, select. Oh, Jeff, Jeff, go back to yes. export the model again. I've I found it. I found I found the nuts. Oh, hey, hey, so, yeah. So look on the right side there where it says transform, where it says negative Z forward and Y up. <laughs> so that's that. But then if you open up geometry. <laughs> oh, man. Scroll down, triangulate faces. Oh, my God. 
Blender is officially my favorite program. In this the is world great. Now. This is great. Cool. All right. I have, I have no more complaints about Blender's strange orientation. Okay. Yeah. It just it just can do it, right? Mm -hmm. And then I figured out a sort of a, a, a sequence of keys to do this quickly. Oh wow, we we got like two thousand more lines of code out of that. Yeah, which well, makes sense. That's uh, so no whammies, sick. no whammies. It's gonna hot reload in a hot second. Here we go. There we go. There's a full tank. Amazing. Yeah. Oh wait, so we were exporting with negative Z four. We could just export Z forward. Like we don't have to rotate around. We don't have to have that rotation in there anymore either since we control that export. This is great. We, yeah, we I mean, the thing is, negative Z4 is technically correct. Yeah, totally. Um, it's just that the model itself inside that space is not. Uh, it was just, there's like, it's a Russian doll problem of conventions, right? Um, I, li I like that we can export exactly in the format that this wants. Yeah. Boy, this really that really speaks to the conversation with your friends. Saying yeah. that there, actually, there absolutely is no convention, so the tools are just like, what do you, what do you want? <laughs> exactly. Um, and then if I look at the hierarchy, uh, uh, it's up on the under tank root. Is what you're looking for? Yeah, yeah. I, I just selected the wrong. Um... Oh no, it's above this panel. It's like in the scene. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Tank base. I think tower is the thing. So I think tower is the root node of that. So tower and and it looks like barrel is yeah. But the problem is the OBJ format loses that hierarchy, I think, mm -hmm. right? I think it loses the notion. I think it does. Anyways, uh, we'll, we'll maybe look into that a little bit more. We'll there, I think yeah. the future is in GLTF anyways. That's probably true. Um, but uh, uh, OK. We can make some overture towards lighting right now. Let's do it. Um, Oh right, because this thing is full of normals. We're it's full of normals, and I think we've got normals. Yeah, just to confirm, there are vertex normals in this file, right? VNs. Yeah. Whew. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um. Oh no! This is not what I want. This is what I want, um, and we're basically we're we're parsing the normals here, right? We've got mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. I wonder we just return them. We just... So we've got normals okay. if we wanted, um, and they're uh, and it, it, does our our VA, right now our VAOs don't load them, right? Um, That's probably true. Load model, but they could. They could. We load it for a particular shader, and our shader doesn't even take it. So we have a standard shader. Basically, we need to have some notion of light. Um, and so the lighting equation is you take, you figure out like how oblique the surface is to the direction of the light. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be a basically constant multiplier on the color of the surface. Hmm. Is it? Uh, we have. Do we have this in our three D HTML example? Uh, yes, I got rid of that. Oh, okay, great. Um, however, uh, WebGL to state diagram. <laughs> Uh, I think it's just straw cubes, right? We've got, we've got a bunch of this stuff. 
Can I make this? I can't. We're going to use a bunch of constants right now. So what we just really care about is this, the text of it. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have a notion of a light direction, and we have a normal. Mm -hmm. um, and then the light intensity is multiplied by the color value. Um, and then we compose it with the alpha. Uh, OK. So we do a dot product. OK, this is actually the secret sauce. Uh, hmm. I wish I had my. I wish I had my my uh, tablet with me right now so I could draw on the whiteboard. But uh, dot product is basically the way that you measure how par parallel two lines are. Uh, the dot product is basically like if I take if I got this line and I got this line, right? You can kind of see that in the camera, mm -hmm. and I take the projection of this vector along the, the other line, the other vector. So like this vector could be really long, right? Could be like, could be much longer. And the projection of it is like whatever the shadow of that, um, that vector is along this line. Mm -hmm. And I take that projection and multiply it by the thing that it's parallel to. That's your dot product. Um, and so what that means is if, if, is, is if the two vectors are totally orthogonal, your dot product is zero. Um, but then the more parallel they are, your dot product gets, gets larger. Oh, larger. clever. OK. Yeah. Hmm. Um, the normals and the lighting direction ought to be actually normal um, so that your dot product can never be higher than 1. When I say mm -hmm. normal, I mean that they're unit vectors. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's true of what Blender exported, but let's just hope it is. Yeah, well, I noticed <laughs> that the line right above uses normalized to at least assure that for the normal. Oh, yeah. So maybe we could just do that. Um, so I guess we just can copy some of this stuff. Uh, we normalize capital N normal. I don't know what our whole mm -hmm. capitalization scheme is. The light direction needs to be a uniform. Uh, well, we can just hard code it here, right? Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, totally. How do I? It's just vec3. Mm -hmm. And maybe we just have the light direction going directly west facing, just so, so it's basically just down the positive x axis. OK. Uh, let's add a little bit of jazz in there. Uh, And then it is multiplying it times 0 0.5 and then adding 5. So basically what they're saying is there's a constant amount of light. Right, point, so even 0.5 if, is the lowest we'll go. It's the lowest it'll go. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then. So, so essentially, is, yeah, the, we're clamping the we're clamping it from 0.5 to 1. But we can actually change that to have more dramatic. Color.rgb. How are they combined? This is it vec4? Are they doing vec4 of light times color.rgb, color.a? And rgb and dot, dot rgb and dot a are just ways of decomposing this. I think you can also do that dot x, y, z, w oh, really if you cool. wanted to as well. Huh. Um, hmm. OK, so that is our shader. Uh, I think all hell will break loose if we look at what's happening in the game right now. Let's find out. Yes. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's all right. This is what we expected. But <laughs> now we can. Uh, when we load the shader, load shader. Let us also add an attribute here. Oh, it's, it's already in there. We actually found the attribute. It, it just like iterates over the, uh, oh, no, wait, 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 wait. Uh, standard shader, I actually enumerate them in a manifest here. So the attributes mm. are normal. 
I think I can actually automate this. I think there's a way to query attributes. Oh, that'd be really cool. Actually, I, I, I'll take that back. I don't. I don't. Think, I somehow don't think it, it knows. Because like it loses these names when it compiles it, right? When you, there's no reason why it would keep these names around after you compile a shader. That's just fluff. Um, so I added this sort of meta format here, just so like we can re reference these attributes. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So now they'll be available here. And so when we load a model, the model definition has normals in it. So we're just going to say that positions, colors, and we just need to add another thing that's just normals, right? And in fact, it's probably more like positions, right? <laughs> normals, position attrib. not equal to undefined because it's not only one of our shaders has normals in it right so we should account for that here mm -hmm. um oh and then lend 329 attribute get normal uh, yeah normal uh it's three floats mm -hmm. and then model dot normals nice right Oh, holy hell. That's incredible. Dude. <laughs> I like that the cubes are also suddenly just lit. <laughs> and the trees are fucking off. <laughs> did we add normals to the cubes? That was a... Yeah, we did, because they just, like... They're very easy normals. I think I think that's what we used to test the vertex normal parsing last I think last the normals time. are reversed. Right? Our, our light... Normals are reversed... Our light should be coming in. Our light is pointing to positive. OK, well, the light vector is 1, 0 0.50. 0. And if you take the dot product, hmm. like, does that light vector mean the direction the light is going or the direction the light is coming from? Hmm. I think it's the direction of the surface to the light origin. Oh, I see. Interesting. Well, what what side is brighter right now? It actually kind of looks like the south side is brighter than the north. Well, it's weird. It's like... Wait. Uh, as we rotate the tank, the normal is not rotating with it. It's always the same side. The, the, the dark side of the tank changes. Oh, you're absolutely right. So we need to transform the normal by the model view matrix, right? Oh, fuck. Uh, and I think our example did that. Yes, the normal is getting transformed. Mm, okay. Oh, and it's right there. Great. Yes. On line 17. Normal equals model view. So it's world to view, model to world huh. of the normal but the normal is a th oh it's turning this into a mat three so it's just saying you know what we're gonna throw away the extra stuff nice uh normal good call very observant it's i couldn't i couldn't figure out why the cube and the tank looked so incorrectly lit together yeah oh oh no Shader uniform projection not defined. I, I think we just added a oh, uh, compile error here. Mat three. Mat three. Yep. Program not linked. <laughs> Get out of here. Program not linked. Oh, it's because I mean I see that's because of the mat three though. Yeah. Okay. It looks like the hot reload. I I, I think if. There's like an early, oh, okay. Okay. Oh yeah, that's great. 
Okay. Yeah. This this is this is looking really lit <laughs> in both senses of the word. Um, so it does look like. Oh, that's cool. Our if our light source is at positive one x, mm -hmm. it is the direction towards the light. It's, it's like where is the light source relative to uh, the origin of the world? Where's if that makes sense. Place? So it's not the angle. It's not the direction of. It's not the light ray. It's the inverse of the light ray. That's what that's what that light vector is. Hmm. Right, because our light vector uh, currently is the value one, which is a positive x, and so that's actually pointing to the east, right? But it's brighter on the east side of things, right? So it's actually the opposite of the the direction that the light is traveling. Yeah, that's interesting, huh? Yeah, which actually makes sense in the math. The math is doing the dot product of these two, um, and so if they're pointing in the same direction. You're going to get a more positive value. You're going to get a higher value of, of light. Oh, I see. So since our light points this way, yeah. Okay, and then the faces that have their normals point that way are brighter. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And this is pure. This is looking pretty black right here. I wonder. I mean, I bet it's. Half, you think this is just? I bet it's fifty percent gray. gray. Yeah. Well, th toss the change the threshold up if you want to see uh, the delta there, like. Let's do point two five yeah, seven five seven five yeah yeah exactly. I think I think that's key. Also, I think my normal is not normal. This is I should. Your normal is not normal. Oh. Does that make sense? What I did right there. Yeah. This is not of length one. It is of higher than length one. Because I added this 0, 0 0.5 on the y-axis, just mm. as a little jazz riff. Yeah. All right, so it's brighter now. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's totally brighter it's, now. It's much softer, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I liked it better before. Same. Huh? Four and six. Gosh, we got lighting in there in 10 minutes. How cool is that? <laughs> it's just open jail. It does all the work for us. This is so good. That looks great. Okay, cool. Uh, our trees are dead. Yeah, what's up with that? What's up with our trees being dead? If we don't... I would have thought that they would draw at least something because but their they... normals are all going to be, like, dead, right? They're going to be, like, nothing. Their normal is zero. Did we not... We're not getting any debug... Uh, we're not getting any errors uh -huh. either, right? Uh, well... Oh. I, it's probably that. Do we have 256 trees? I believe that. <laughs> oh, is that what it is? Yeah. Uh, maybe. Or it stops I, at 256. Okay, so what if we faked it? Right, should everything... Uh, have a normal of just facing east? Yeah. Or it should be just facing... Oh, yeah. Well, how do we... How do we even well, backfill this? Rather facing it, it's just the normal should be. Mm -hmm. God, that's a good question. It's like the backfill doesn't. There has yeah, to be this equal is, number. This is actually a hard problem. Yeah, uh, I'm okay losing the trees. Okay. Yeah, I can still shoot them. Still, they're still. They're still. They're still, still the legacy them of them trees. is still there. Yeah. Ah, ah. Um, why is it magenta? Oh, because we don't have actual vertex colors in there. Yeah, we tossed all the materials. You could put like a used material on the tank if you wanted to see something. Uh, and our materials are just colors, because the yeah, tank is right black, now. so we're gonna get different shades of black. You could you could put the wall material on it. They're okay. they're pretty yeah. They're not super serious. <laughs> uh, hello, tank. And I guess we, we probably have some use MTLs in use there. Use MTL. Oh, wait. Was that already in there? Uh, it was. Use MTL wall. Is that what you were proposing? Yeah. What? Oh, it just... I just did it. Okay. Wild. Waiting for the reload. I wish this was, this was faster. It needs to be 10 times faster. I know. Eh, looks like a tank. Oh. 
Yeah, it looks it's looking pretty tank. Pretty Dude. cool tank. Let's make it. Let's make it look like the tree. This is so neat. <laughs> I didn't expect it to work this quickly. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Same. <laughs> <laughs> it's truly perplexing. Yeah. But you know, I, I think some of the refactoring helped. The fact that we could add properties to the shader as quickly as we as as we were able to. I'm really. I'm not sad it worked this quickly. This is really cool. Yeah. All right. Now this is looking. Oh, that's very tanky. Almost too tanky, I'm going to say. Uh, impossible. Yeah, I, I, I think it looks a little bit too much like a, like a plastic military man. Um, and uh, a little bit too military. Despite the fact that we're making a game about the Thanks. quintessential military vehicle, this, this feels uncomfortably militaristic to me. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> we need to lean into the cyberpunk, so yeah, I, I think we can get back there. This is great. But this is super dope. Uh, it makes it so that if I turn the debug draw off, it's it's a little bit more tolerable, right? Because we've got we've got wow. some we've got some texture on the walls. Just just the, down, the cubes down here, look here really it's good. a little bit more interesting. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. If only if only them trees are there. We should just we should grab a new tree model and run it through Blender and do that. Okay. You want to do that now? I mean, we're we're a little bit past the hour. Uh, no, let's call it. let's call it now. But. Okay. Perhaps, well, got, perhaps I should do whole, tomorrow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We've got the whole week ahead of us. Yeah. A whole week off. Whoa, so, so luxurious. Some <laughs> coffee. Mm. Make break, Make a real breakfast for yourself. Oh, man. Uh, that's That's been one of my favorite I love this game. This game is the best game ever. Look, it's, we've got these wireframe cubes that we can shoot at. Oh, game. my God. This game is... You know how we were just talking about how our breakout game was, like, the best game ever? I mean, it was like... we just didn't know the depth, the heights... And yeah, we, we've we we've would... surpassed ourselves, <laughs> <laughs> and 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 really, that's the, that's the sign of true artistic greatness is not just to deliver once, but to deliver consistently, right? <laughs> and I, I believe that uh, we're well on our way to proving our ability to do that. Oh, look, and and, and the, uh, the, the 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 pickups still render, and everything is shaded because they're all cubes. Yeah. Ah, I yeah. love it. Our shader is shading. It's wild to me that that is how you add lighting. Like, frankly, that doesn't makes sense but it's it was, delightful yeah it was one line of code three lines of code <laughs> it's this line of code and this line of code i mean the math don't argue with the math the math i i would never argue with the math the yeah, math is don't pretty cool don't don't mess with the math <laughs> all right no need for the vec3 any, any, anymore sweet uh, in fact probably we should not be doing any of this I think I think we can toss that. Yeah, we can toss forward. this stuff in general. Yeah. Yeah, but no hang more on, manifesting. Hang on. You've got a just... you've got to parse ten thousand lines about ESLint before you can do anything. Friggin' ESLint. God, why is it so slow? Everything everything about this is ridiculous. The fact that like we're loading like ten thousand JavaScript dependencies just to do some trivial text transform at a certain level bothers me intensely. As it should. Yeah. <laughs> I like how everything's kind of dark right now. It's starting to look a little bit, a little bit cyberpunky, right? It's so a little good. bit night. Yeah. We're we're gonna get there. I'm very, very excited. Okay. All right. Well, hope you enjoyed your week off. We're back into it. We're back in business. Oh man, we business sure are. Business is booming. Look Thank those, you, stimulus check. Those lights. Yes. Nice work, Jeff. This is really cool. I'm, cool. Mm, mm hmm. All right. Let's go eat ice cream. Oh, that's a great idea. I don't have any ice cream. I'm going to eat something <laughs> sweet, though. All right. Goodbye, the Twitch. See everybody.